So welcome everybody. I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We're the world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. We essentially train and certify home inspectors all over the world. And we also do these free online live interactive classes on NACHI TV. And today is May 23rd. And if you'd like to contact me or anybody on InterNACHI staff, we're on the contact page. And that's at that URL, um, natchi.org forward slash contact. And if you'd like to watch the video recording of this class or register for an upcoming class, um, they're free. Registration is free. Just enter your name and email. And that's at natchi.tv, N-A-C-H-I dot TV. And we're going to do a home inspection on this house, essentially. Um, and I performed this inspection. And this home is in Pennsylvania, and it's raining. So we're going to take a look at that and uh, see if it has any um, effect on our inspection observations. Before we do that, one URL that's really important. If you're trying to find um, your membership benefits or training and certification courses or marketing pieces or marketing services, design services that are free for our members, um, or how to build a really great website for free, things like that, um, go to natchi.org forward slash everything. And there we try to put everything that you may need. Um, so after this class, uh, go there and see what's there. There's actually 15 steps. Um, 15 chunks of information, and you should just follow those steps, those 15 steps, towards success in your home inspection business, and we laid it out in 15 steps. So here's a home. Obviously, it's a two-story, right? Detached home. Uh, it's raining. Uh, it's in a shaded area, a lot of trees around, and there's a lot of wood around it. So this house was a wooden house, cedar siding, and wood shingle roof. Now, according to the standards of practice, you're not required, you are not required to walk upon any roof surface. Um, you are required to inspect every roof, if you can, um, either from the eaves or from the ground, or provide a reason that that type of inspection, the roof inspection, was restricted. So we can talk about exceeding the standards of practice, but I tend to exceed the standards of practice. Remember, the standards of practice is a minimum. It requires you to do a few things, and it also excludes many things. You're not required to um, find every defect in a home, for example. You're not required to predict future conditions. You're not required to predict the estimated life of a particular system or component. You're not required to report upon anything you did not observe and deemed major. Um, so the standards of practice is really important. Um, the standards of practice, the Home Inspector Standards of Practice, um, InterNACHI's Standards of Practice is at nachi.org forward slash SOP. And I use the standards of practice as my base, my foundation. It's the minimum standard. So you have to do at least what is required of the standards, right? And if you exceed those standards, which I believe many inspectors do, um, there are some legal guidelines that we have provided also about doing that so that you feel confident during your inspections following the standards of practice. So personally, I owned a home inspection business in Pennsylvania. Um, did many thousands of inspections, I'm a certified master inspector, and I exceeded the standards of practice for just about every client. And one of the things that I liked to do was to get up on a roof. I was a home builder, I installed roofs for a living, I took training classes, I worked with other roofers, I was very confident in my skills as a roofer. So I wasn't... Um, um, I didn't hesitate very much about using a 28-foot fiberglass ladder there. I also had a 40-foot aluminum ladder to do barns. I also carried around a 12-foot aluminum 
just to get up on the one-story ranchers, and a step ladder to get into the attic, collapsible ladder, just in case I needed to really fit it in to something where um, a step ladder wouldn't work. Also had um, a short step ladder, a three step ladder, just to get into the crawl space that's elevated a little bit above the ground or basement floor. Also had crawl gear. So I went from ground level, under the floor spaces, to on top. And everything in between, and I took pictures like this, and I put those pictures in my inspection report, like I said before, at the beginning of the class, your inspection report is probably your most important marketing piece that you could produce. And you produce this marketing piece every day. So you should work on it every day. If a potential buyer is reading your inspection report, they should have enough information to make a smart decision in hiring you. And one of the things that I did was I realized that and I wanted to communicate that I bring tall ladders to all of my inspections. And if I can safely, I'll get up on the roof. So back to this inspection, I get up on the roof and there's actually a nice flat area where I can stand on this roof. It's made out of metal, has a skylight, and I get to look at almost all of the wood shingle roof from a nice safe vantage point. So obviously, um, this is in a shaded area. There's a lot of moss and algae and green stuff going on and, and uh, dissolving of the shingles. I'm not too concerned about any cosmetic um, issues. So cosmetic defects, I may note them, but I really played them down. I really wanted to get to the things that matter in a home inspection. There are like four things really that matter in a home inspection. Um, cosmetic imperfections, flaws, cosmetic defects um, are, are not part of that uh, group of four. What I would really like to get to is the major defects that I both observe and deem to be major. Um, so the shingle, this is either a shake or a shingle roof, it's shingle. Um, and the differences between the two, um, there are some differences, I would say. They're very similar, more than different. Um, but if you wanted to know um, a heck of a lot more on, on how to inspect a wood shingle roof or wood shake roof, uh, we have that training available for you. And I can show you the link to get there. Um, what I like to do is like to show that I get up close and personal to every system and component. So I take a lot of pictures. So I take a lot of um, pictures like this. I like to take a look at every plane, every field, every surface, flat surface of the roof covering. Um, and I'm inspecting essentially the roof covering materials. Remember, I'm not inspecting the roof system. The roof system um, includes, I would say, I would argue, um, hidden components that I can't see, a lot of the structure that I cannot see. So I'm really inspecting the roof covering. So careful with your, with your report narratives. Don't say that you're inspecting the entire system. For example, you can't see underlayment, which um, is not required or recommended um, for a wood shingle shake roof. I like to take these pictures to show my client that I'm actually there, I'm touching it, I'm up close, I'm trying to get as much information as possible. This is a really great picture for um, a website or your inspection report. I'm not too concerned about the little, uh, we'll call them checks, cracks. What I don't want to see is a split, something that goes through the entire material. What would be really bad is if it was, and, and that, they naturally crack, right, over time and weather and wear out. But what I really don't want to see is um, damage, maybe from footfall or um, hail or something else mechanical, uh, a split that goes through the entire shingle. And worse yet, um, one that is on top of um, an edge, a butt edge, an opening. So a couple of things about wood shingles, wood shake roofs. Um, there shouldn't be any underlayment for wood shingles or shakes. Um, maybe some ice and water shield, depending upon the, the location of the home, the climate um, zone. And shakes have interlayment, which is like a strip of uh, felt paper for every row. 
but it shouldn't be um, observable because it can deteriorate in the sun. I'll show you a picture of that. And modern codes require a minimum slope for shakes and shingles. You should have that in mind. And one other thing, oh, I wanted to hook up my iPhone to show you um, an app. I have an app for a slope. It's really great. I, they come out with really good ones. Let's see if you can see this in the camera. Can you see that? In the camera, if I turn it, that's a 612, and here comes a 412, right? So um, this is, comes in really handy. You can take it, snap a picture, and um, include that in your inspection report. Um, and a starter course for a wood shingle roof should be doubled up at the eaves and a little bit of overhang, about an inch on the rakes and maybe an inch or more on the, the gutter edge. There's the intermittent um, layer of felt paper for this roof and uh, shake roof, and unfortunately, it's observable. It should be tucked back a little bit. Here are some splits that I don't like very much, um, and we were talking about the, the location of some, and let's see if I can work this. I wonder if this will work for me here. So if I bring this up, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hold on a second. I'm trying to get, sorry, I should have uh, done this before. Okay, so um, what I don't like is um, the location of that, right? So this crack is on top of this opening, and um, they had a crack here and a crack here, crack here. But um, this, oops, <laughs> for, um, for shingle, for sh this is why shingles are offset. Uh, asphalt shingles, laminate shingles. Um, this was on top of this, and this was on top of this. So right here is actually a repair, and they put a piece of metal in here. Because, um, I don't know, I don't know why they didn't repair this, but if you follow the path of the cracks, you follow the path of the water. So think of water, how it runs down a structure, um, starting at the ridge and then goes down the plains. It's finding any type of opening, right? Even a, a small nail hole will, would be a water entry point. Cracks and openings in between the shingle pieces, um, regardless of whether it's wood or asphalt, um, would be a, an entry, a potential entry point. And I think this was damaged here and it's on top. So I'm looking for offset patterns, right? I don't want cracks on top of cracks. I don't want openings on top of openings. That would not be good. So we want an offset pattern. So I'm taking pictures, more pictures, more pictures, more pictures. I actually give all these pictures. I don't like that tree. It's in contact. I can see that it's in contact with the roof. Um, I actually give all of my pictures to my client. Um, used to be on CD, now USB. Now you can just download it from cloud station or something like that. Um, I try to put as many pictures as possible, like 40 pictures in the inspection report, but I'll take probably three or 400 pictures. This house, probably 400 pictures. Um, I have missing uh, cap shingles, right? Uh, things on the top at the ridge, they're missing. Missing and loose. Loose, missing, cracked, yep. And if you wanted to um, take a really great course, um, Internet's Kenton Shepherd a great instructor and certified master inspector, um, helped us produce a, an online video course on how to inspect um, roof shingles, wood roofs. And um, it's a really great video. Um, let's see. So it's at that really long URL. Let's see if I can go back to my slide. Excessively long URL. Uh, I think we do that for SEO purposes. But if you're looking for that um, video course, it's actually on this URL, natchee.org 3C. It stood for a company that used to work with us. So natchee.org forward slash 3C. If you go there, we have everything you need to learn how to inspect a roof. We have certifications. We have online courses and um, check out that resource. That's a really great resource on how to inspect a roof of any type. Oh, 
Carl asked, what app was that? Uh, hold on. Let me check it out. It's called Pitch Factor. P-I-T-C-H Factor. F-A-C-T-O-R in one word. Pitch Factor. I may have purchased it. I can't remember if it was free or a few dollars. So if the audio goes out, uh, hang in there. It will sometimes come back. <laughs> um, hope you can hear me now. So um, remember, this is going to be video recorded. And I, I often repeat myself anyways. Uh, so I'm at the um, chimney area, required to inspect the chimney, not the interior flue. But I realize I'm looking at the chimney, and all this rust and corrosion is going on. And I realize that the caps are actually missing. Um, there's the... I don't know what happened to the, the caps. The caps themselves blew off, I would, I would assume, or rusted away. It's hard to say. Um, but I can't get to them, so there's an inspection restriction. If I was able to walk upon this wood shingle roof, um, I would. I'm not going to. I'm kind of a heavy guy. Uh, I'll break the heck out of those shingles, or I'll uh, slip right off of the roof because they're slippery. Um, but I'd love to get to that chimney. If I were there, I'd be looking at the wash, the cap, the crown, making sure there's a bit of a drip edge. I look at the flashing step, counter flashing, the exterior condition of the masonry um, fireplace chimney. It looks like two fireplaces. Um, and, uh, or it could be one fireplace and one flue for an HVAC system. So I'll take a look at that. Um, if you see something rectangular at a masonry chimney, that's that indicates um, high indication of a of a fireplace. Uh, square flue would be a, a flue for uh, a um, fuel fired heating system. Um, and then with my camera, I would take a shot of the flue, even though I'm not required to inspect the flue. I would definitely use my high lumens flashlight that I get from Inspector Outlet um, and uh, shine it down there and take a picture with my camera and maybe do a zoom. Often when I do that, I tend to find defects in the terracotta flue liner. So that tree is definitely in contact with the roof. I'm gonna put that in the report. But now I think it's so close, it may have caused some damage. I wish I could walk out on that roof, but I can't. So I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna go around on the exterior from the ground and see if I can see anything. Again, I try to take pictures of everything. Um, that looks like the garage roof structure there. Um, and let's see, did I? Yeah. So just going through my slides. So uh, after I'm done inspecting the roof, I like to take a look at the roof penetrations and the flashing areas and anything that penetrates through the roof covering surface or um, intersects with the roof, like a wall, a head wall. So the vent here, the main sewer vent stack, um, four inches diameter, looks like cast iron, and the vent Flashing looks really good. Skylights. There's a lot of debris, so I can't really see a whole lot of the flashing, the head, fla um, head flashing, the apron, the step flashing, the counter flashing, but I'm doing the best I can. Um, and that looks like a vent hood for maybe a dryer or, or something, a bathroom exhaust. There's some uh, pieces of flashing, like the copper, um, copper standing seam flashing in the valley and other flashing uh, where there isn't a gutter. So there isn't a gutter here, so they're kind of diverting water, no gutter here, diverting water away so that I'm um, in this direction so it can not drop to the floor. It's kind of an odd thing, but that's okay. And also the um, uh, in cold climates, we do crazy things like we put live electrical wires on our roofs, plug them in, and they warm up the snow and ice so that it doesn't build up and cause ice dams. Um, not recommended, but uh, that's what we do in the, in the Northeast, cold climates. Uh, the valley is totally covered with debris. So you're gonna get this every year. This homeowner should know that they have overhanging trees, a lot of debris on the roof. I can't see what's going on, um, but um, when you have things like this, piles of debris, like pine needles, 
um, that are inches thick, that's like four inches thick of pine needles right there in that valley, that's not going to allow the roof to shed water. And roofs are not designed, um, sloped roofs are not designed, shingle roofs are not designed to be waterproof, but water resistant. Um, they're designed to shed water off of the roof. Um, so if things are not flowing off the roof, um, that roof is no longer water resistant. So it needs to be cleaned off. The skylight on the short little metal roof that I was standing on and inspecting, it looks really good. Copper, the seams are great. I'm getting off of my roof, um, I'm getting off of the roof using my ladder. As I come down, I'm taking advantage of where I am on my ladder. So I'm looking to the left and right in front of me and I can see that the tree is in contact with the siding and also the roof. So there's damage actually from a tree branch going right into the siding. And the siding is just like the roof, cedar, shingle. The manufacturer probably has some recommendations. There are standards and best practices on how to fasten and install um, wood siding. So there's different styles, there's boards at an angle and shingles. So I'm really looking for um, Good installation techniques, good workmanship, um, best practices being followed. I'm not really concerned about code. I'm not a code inspector, although I use it as knowledge, as a knowledge base. And I'm looking for um, large things that are obvious to me, like um, defective installation techniques or poor fastening or damage or missing pieces. And also take video during my inspections. The copper men are a lot of debris lying on the roof because of the... I can't reach the top of the masonry fireplace, but new caps and screens are... So all these videos are kind of cool. Main sewer vent pipe coming up through the... So I take advantage of being up on the roof, and if I can do a video, I'm going to. And when I play my videos, at the end of the inspection in the kitchen, because that's where I set up and I kind of leave from the kitchen, uh, where we go over the summary report. Um, I'll play the videos for my client and I'll make sure that their agents are around me, right? Because <laughs> this is kind of like the shock and awe of, uh, of one of my inspections. So I'll, I'll play the videos and they'll realize that this isn't just a general video about roof maintenance. This is a video of their roof. And it's um, such an impact. I've I've always received really great feedback from that. They're shocked to actually see their roof. Some homeowners will never go up on a roof. So I'll film, I'll video the entire roof inspection. If they're not with me at all, I'll video the entire inspection. And um, technology is getting more affordable and, and that's becoming a, a new trend now. So I love this, love inspecting decks especially huge ones like this. Um, I, 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 I've been trained to inspect the deck through InterNACHI. We have a lot of deck courses and deck videos. And the way I approach a deck like this is from bottom up. So I start from the bottom. I wanna see what the foundation is, what the posts are doing, what the main beam, load bearing beam is doing. And then I wanna look at attachment. I wanna make sure that that ledger board is installed well according to code or best practices. And then I'm going around the house. So what I tend to do is I come off the roof and just about then my client shows up because I get there early and I shake their hand and give them a bunch of business cards and I tell them about the condition of the roof or anything that I've observed. And um, I invite them around the exterior with me and we'll go around once very quickly. I'm not really going into a lot of details and then I'll, tell them to go in and do whatever they want, take a look around and they won't miss a thing. I'm gonna go around the exterior one more time and actually do the inspection with pictures and videos and testing and things like that. And then I'll come in and I'll find them and I'll take them to the HVAC system. I'll try to do the big components first. I don't start off with uh, kitchen things. Um, nothing's really exciting in the kitchen usually. Um, it's the big systems that are expensive and important and physically large um, that are kind of exciting to show your client. 
Once I get through the HVAC, so it's roof, exterior, HVAC. Once I get to that point, they're kind of like peeling off and letting me go because I have uh, gained their trust within a short time, maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, doesn't matter who's with me. It could be licensed contractors or family members um, or real estate agents. Um, about that time, they start to like mm, peel off. They want to look around and they understand that I will get them if I see something that they need to see, like a defect or something that they need to see because it's um, a main water shut off valve or something to do with home maintenance. Yep. So that's how I handle uh, inspections. And we, I don't do pool inspections and I disclaim it in my inspection report. However, we, Internachi does have an online training course um, about pools and spas, if you wanted to know how to inspect them. So the sealant where the corner trim, or any trim, meets um, a different application of the siding material. Right? So the wood siding meets the trim, and right there, maybe the manufacturer recommends a nice bead of uh, brown sealant, exterior sealant, and that sealant has um, aged, cracked, dried, and is peeling off. The siding looks in really good shape. I like it a lot. It's a really nice, interesting wood exterior. There's the peel of the sealant. And some areas were washed off, power washed off gently. And some areas were chewed up by um, squirrel, chipmunk, uh, bird, something. So I'm looking for damaged shingles as well. And there's wood rot there. Love to stick my screwdriver in or my finger right in to the wood rot, um, break the paint. Um, I don't cause damage. I observe damage and I find and I discover damage. And if that happens to be sticking my finger into um, deteriorated rotten wood, so be it. Um, and so I take a picture of that and I don't hide it. Um, I make sure that the, anyone knows, the agent or the homeowner knows that I found wood rot at this window and my hand went through. Sometimes I'll be underneath the sink, bathroom sink, with, um, you know, um, one of those soft metal, soft um, brass um, chrome plated uh, traps. And uh, I'll just crush the trap because it's so deteriorated. Um, it looked maybe deteriorated or something. I just give every trap a little squeeze. And sometimes they just crack right in my hand. Well, I don't hide it. I take a picture of it. I label the sink, don't use the water because the trap is damaged. And um, I put that in my report. So if you ever break something during an inspection, while you're performing an inspection according to the standards of practice, doing a visual only inspection, and something breaks in your hand, like a, you, your finger goes into wood rot, or you crush a tr trap at a sink, um, people should congratulate you. That's your job, to find problems before someone else does. So there must be something wrong at that window there. I'm concerned about more wood rot at that window. Can't inspect all the windows, not required to. I'm supposed to inspect things from the ground, so I am, and I'm inspecting things from the ground. There could be more wood rot up there, but I'm not required to find every defect in the home. I'm only required by the standards of practice to um, report upon defects that I both observe and deem to be material. Some shingles that are actually thinned out. You can see the the support batten board uh, below it. And some of the fasteners are here and there, uh, maybe to hold down some of the shingles that have curled in the past. I'm not too concerned about that. I'm not too concerned about the, the hairline crack in the concrete block CMU masonry foundation, kind of common. A little concerned about the landscaping and how does the landscaping affect the house? Does it divert water away, for example? Or does it uh, retain and hold water and direct water towards the structure? And are there steps that are missing? Well, there are. So I'll put that in the report. And I'll just walk around, make sure that the walks, the steps, the driveways, the stoops, the stairs are in good shape. The retaining wall here is not in good shape. Structurally, I think it's okay. It's not leaning. 
but the exterior coating is popping off because this wall is holding back an enormous amount of water from the front yard. The front yard comes down to the house and the water wraps around the right side of the house, around the garage to the driveway, and there's this retaining wall here. And that moisture is just popping off masonry ex exterior coating. It's so much fun to find. So anything I can do to put my hand in there to show how the material is popping off, it also shows scale, um, it shows deterioration. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words. That's why I take so many pictures and try to put them all in my inspection report. The, there is no lean in the structural integrity of the, of the wall, but you can see on the left side of this wall, there's a lot of pressure on this wall, a lot of hydrostatic pressure water pressure, and I'm concerned about it. That's why I took another picture. And there's missing deteriorated steps. And in the front, now, front right corner, there's a low spot, and I'm trying to communicate with my hand in my picture that there's, I believe, a lot of water resting right here. It's not really being diverted away. And I don't see any um, drainage system. Like, you know, on my home, I. Uh, we had water penetration, so it was easily fixed by the exterior. You work from the outside in to fix water problems. So on the outside, you do trenches and French drains, they're called, and you know, some things you can lay down. Um, but I don't see any of that here. I think this area is waterlogged and water soaked, and it doesn't have anywhere to go. And all these roots and trees just absorb and retain water right up against the, the house foundation. Love thinking about how to inspect for moisture intrusion. We actually have, do you see the pattern? We actually have an online course titled How to Inspect for Moisture Intrusion. It's a really great class. You should take a, a course, an online course. Just take a look at it. Can't get underneath. Steps look okay. There's a tree, adult tree, two feet away from the foundation. Not all, you know, not a great idea. Here's the garage structure. The roof of the garage was cleaned off. Not sure why, make it pretty. Driveway looks okay. There's my old van. Um, the, from this vantage point, I can see down to the rear yard. Um, this house is on a hill and there's the pool there. Above, retaining walls. So I'm literally taking 360 pictures. If I was an inspector now, I'd be using a 360 virtual camera, um, taking images and video, 3D, 360. But I'm trying to take a picture of just about everything. And it's essentially what I do during my inspection. I'm looking around at everything, getting, I'm stepping back, taking a look at what's going on. And I step back from this house and I can see there's a lot of things going on with water. And I then move closer and I look, not from the system viewpoint, but then component viewpoint, right? So I wanna get down and dirty and get closer and closer as I look. And from this vantage point, I can see, now I can really see what's going on. From the top of the hill, the top of the entry steps going down, there's just all this water going right to the house. So much fun to figure this out. And the garage isn't helping either. It has water coming towards it, and it's also directing water to the house. Uh, it's on a private well system. So there's a private well, private well head. I like to take the cap off and take a look at the writing underneath, a date, depth, flow, but I can't get it off. The cap won't come off. So now I start to look at the components, the wall, and I see that we have these pipes coming out. And most of the country has no idea what these are. There's an oil tank stored in, inside the house. And this is the fill pipe on the left and the vent pipe of that tank on the right. So we actually dump crude oil, essentially oil, into a big, large metal tank inside a home. And that's the fill pipe. And when you fill that tank with oil, it displaces air and that's a vent pipe coming out. It's almost insane. So there's the fill pipe and there's the vent pipe. 
Um, so we're going to, I know now I don't have a heat pump. I don't have electric heating. I have a fuel burning heating system. It could be a boiler. It could be a fuel fired, oil fired furnace. Not sure. I'm excited to see. There's the electric meter on the outside. Before I go any further, do we have any questions? Uh, I live in Ontario. Awesome. Thanks. What's up with that sound? What about the flashing? Uh, Maybe there's something I missed during the inspection. You can always ask me or email me later. Um, I'm on the contact page and we can go over it. But I'm sure there's a few things I'm going to um, skip over. Uh, if you could yell at me, I'll try to see uh, if you uh, catch something that I didn't go over. So let's see here. Looking at the questions. Uh, did you inspect the deck of the pool? No, Carla, I did not inspect the deck of the pool. Um, I really just disclaimed the whole system. Um, I'm concerned about the deck that's attached to the house. Um, that's a big one. So I want to make sure that I do that. Um, there are experts who do, do pool decks and pools and all, things like that. There are about 10 windows in a condo. Should I probably inspect them all, right? Uh, Right. If it's a small little condo, I tend to look at, in one floor, I tend to look at um, all of the windows from the exterior and the interior. Um, houses that are, what, 4,000 square feet, um, we charge more for a large house, but I'm not gonna, that doesn't mean I'm going to get to every window or every receptacle or every switch or every light fixture. Um, just can't. We can't do it. That would be a, a several day inspection. So um, uh, the standards of practice require you to do, uh, we use things like representative number, like a representative number of windows. So it's really, and that's defined up to you. Um, it's, in, it's in your best uh, decision for your client. Uh, I find that on some inspections that even though I may quote two and a half to three hours, that at times I go over and I find unforeseen issues um, sometimes I feel that real estate agents get annoyed when I go over there. Yep. Um, so, uh, in the beginning, if you're a new inspector, I would schedule one a day. Okay. And I would, as a new inspector, I would use that to my advantage in my marketing. I would say that if someone's asking me about how many inspections I've done and how much experience do I have and how fast am I going to go, I'm going to compare me and the veteran next to me, the veteran next to me I know probably has two or three home inspections that she is going to blow through because she's certified master inspector, right? And she's scheduled three and she's going to do them as fast as possible, right? But the new inspector, she can say, um, well, I'm here all day if you need me. I'm doing one inspection today and that is you. I have one client today and I'm going to focus on you. So it's all about you today. I tend to go about three hours, but if we go over, I hope you don't mind. There must be a good reason. Maybe we'll find some things that we need to talk about. But usually, on average, we'll do two and a half, three hours. Okay, That kind of frees up. That explains everything. If you go five hours, well, you already explained it. You already set the expectation. right? If you're new, just do one a day and set the expectation that it could go, it could go over. Then. When you become experienced and you're a veteran inspector, uh, you'll probably want to do a couple a day, right? You probably have a crew of inspect inspectors working for you, and you'll be scheduling. A, you have a big board or something electronic online, Google Calendar or something, and uh, you'll be every inspector will be doing one or two a day. So personally, I did eight o'clock and twelve o'clock. My office manager scheduled me for eight o'clock. That means I got on the road at about seven maybe earlier than that if I was going far away. And the next, and it, it took me about three hours to do an inspection. So around 11 o'clock, I could see I got to wrap this up because I'm about a half an hour away from my next job, which is 12 o'clock. So around two and a half hours in is about where I start to wrap things up. I'm going through the interior blown through windows and doors and receptacles and lights and smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors and uh, interior cosmetic things and then wrapping up in the kitchen and I'm done, right? So I can get out of there pretty quickly if I have to. If I have to speed up something, there's really only a couple systems where you can speed through if you have to. 
in order to get to your next job, and that would be interior. Um, I wouldn't speed through any other system, electrical, roof, structure, nope. Those are all kind of the same amount of time. Roof takes about a half an hour, exterior maybe a little bit less than that, um, you know, and the HVAC half hour, you know, and you add them up, and the only thing you can blow through is the interior. And so that's what I would do. I'd leave the, the system or systems that you can easily go through, like bathrooms, geez, you know, toilet, sink, shower, tub, interior, GFCIs, done, go. You know, you can get through a bathroom in about five minutes, boom, 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 boom. Um, so I leave that at the end in order to get my next inspection. But you learn this as you keep doing inspections. The best day will be when you schedule two inspections, your first time where you're scheduled to, and you have to be somewhere else. It's a lot of fun, a lot of pressure. But you learn how to speed up your inspection process with a few tricks. You gotta write your inspection reports using a mobile device. Forget that writing an inspection report at night. Um, I, had, uh, I had kids and a wife and a house I wanted, and hobbies. I wanted to do things at night. I'm not gonna write an inspection report at night, so I got a mobile device. Back then, they were called PDAs. Now, uh, use your smartphone. Takes pictures, takes videos, does all of your inspections right there, uh, upload it to the cloud, download it to the cloud, and you're done, right? Insert pictures at your desktop, 15 minutes tops, you're done. It's a really great, there are a lot of really great softwares out there in order for you to speed up your inspections and get to doing two inspections a day. When you get to do two inspections a day, now you're talking about earning uh, $1,000 gross a day. And that's a great living. Where were, what were we talking about? Oh, yes, right, good question. Um, so um, I would just uh, make friends with real estate agents who you work with and um, set expectations. That it's, there's a, an average time and uh, there could be a little overtime as well. Uh, da, 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 da. Tracy, if an abandoned tank and fill pipes are found, but now there is a gas meter installed by the city, are gas valves in each room not converted to the new gas supply? Are the gas valves in each room not converted? I think I know what you mean. So there's an oil storage tank original to the heating system, and now they've upgraded the heating system, and now they've moved from fuel burning, oil burning uh, boiler to a, a gas boiler, right? Um, the, the best practice um, for a home inspector is to cons um, recommend consulting with a local authority having jurisdiction, which is the township inspector. The township inspector is gonna come in, someone's gonna find that oil tank, if, if not, um, it's up to you to say, here's the oil tank I found. It's in the crawl space. I've done this many times. It's abandoned oil tank in the crawl space, and that sucker is full, right? So they need to empty it and make sure that that tank is safe. What you don't want to do is have an abandoned tank in an area that's difficult to maintain, like a crawl space, because if it's difficult to see, that homeowner is not going in there and monitoring it. So it could deteriorate and then leak, and now you have an environmental problem. That's why abandoned tanks are not a good idea. Emptied tanks are a better idea. And emptied and cut tanks are the best idea. And removed tanks, so that's the number one. So you'll never ever see the old tank. So um, some tanks are emptied, cleaned, cut, and removed, right? Welded cut, torched cut. So yeah, uh, and also you're not required to inspect underground tanks according to the standards of practice, but I'm looking for the pipes. Fill pipes, vent pipes. Yep, some are underground, in the ground. Those are hard, um, hard issues for a lot of homeowners because I can't really help them. The seller has to re really be transparent and disclose buried oil tanks that nobody can see. Uh, I hope that was helpful. Where are we? 10.43 on my time, so that's 45 minutes. Uh, we have a long way to go. So we'll just keep going. Maybe I'll speed up a little bit. Here's cable and phone lines. Oh, there's the deck. So I start with the base um, and I move up. So how is the bottom 
of the posts of the deck connected to and bearing upon the photos. So that looks pretty good. A little off center, but it's, I'm okay with that. And there's metal fasteners used. There's lag screws with washers, and they're not corrosive. And there's metal joist hangers being used and joist fasteners. And there's flashing. I can see the flashing being used. So this is all really good. I really like it. How the, um, the load-bearing beams of the double floor joists uh, of the deck are resting upon the load-bearing post. Um, excellent. That's really great. So there's GFCI protection required at all exterior receptacles. This one is not. A structural problem. So what, does anybody know what that is? Move my water from my infrared camera. If you came late, we were talking about infrared and how you can see water and cannot see water. That's at the same room temperature. Carbonate bees, Carl, that is correct. You win the prize. I don't have anything for you. Uh, here's the WDO inspection guide that InterNACHI has. It's a field guide because um, it's thick paper and it's laminated and it has all of the insects that can destroy wood. Um, I look for anything that destroys wood, right? It's called a wood destroying insect. I don't care about this part. How about wood destroying moisture, right? So um, I'm looking for anything that destroys wood. And if it happens to be a a carpenter bee, um, I can easily identify that. So here's what frass from a carpenter bee is. Um, so basically, they chew up wood, they throw it out, it looks like sawdust, and they excrete while they're doing this. And um, they drill perfect circular half inch diameter holes. They go in in about an inch and they turn 90 degrees and they go down the grain of the wood and they um, put their babies in there. So it kind of looks like this when you open up the wood. So I would use this field guide to show that you have found something that destroys wood and recommend that you're, n and that you're not a, a licensed pesticide applicator, but you recommend one being hired in order to identify the bug, you know, an entomologist, Identify the bug and take care of it because it's destroying the structure of the um, the integrity of the structural components, right? So you don't want that to happen. Pretty easy to find. GFCIs are needed. Uh, that's interior NMB wiring too. Not good. They just need some exterior receptacles for a party outside. I understand, but it has to be GFCI protected and safe. Uh, the tank, pressure tank, and um, components of the pool system were there. And the stair stringers, the load bearing components, the bolts, I really like the entire deck. It's, it's built really well. So that's the deck of the pool, above the pool. Here's the deck above the pool, handrail above the pool. Couple shots. Doggy door. Um, I've mentioned that I'm a pet friendly home inspector. Um, I have a pet dog. Um, pet doors are sometimes a surprise, an unwelcome surprise, an unwelcome feature uh, for a homeowner who does not have pets. That's okay. Um, or maybe you have a pet and they can't fit. Your uh, Great Dane can't fit through that little door. Sealant around the slider window underneath the deck. So while I'm on a deck, I'm kind of looking at taking advantage of these vantage points and looking at other components, kind of mushing the exterior around with the interior. And the fence is okay. Again, more exterior receptacles without GFCI protection. Just looking at anything and everything and taking pictures of the tree roots and how close, the close proximity of this adult tree that's been there for 30 years up against the house. Exterior water faucets in cold climates, uh, especially in Pennsylvania, should be frost-free hose bibs or spigots, and this one is not. Um, you don't want that spigot to freeze up and burst. The front door looks really good. Doorbell does not work. I always ring the doorbell. If it doesn't work, boop, 
put it in the report. It's really a cosmetic kind of thing, but um, I'll do it anyways. It kind of shows you that, uh, that we are um, kind of detail-oriented. Oh, uh, Christopher asks, where is that guide available? Um, right, so let's see if I can write this URL. It's at our e-commerce partner website. I'll write it. It's in inspectoroutlet.com. Inspectoroutlet.com. So go there, and you can um, purchase that guide. Garage. No downspouts, no gutters. Recently cleaned roof. Kind of a strange pattern there. Two garage doors. Roof looks OK. Exterior looks OK. Exterior door, garage door opener works, foundation wall, concrete masonry units, water penetration, signs of water penetration. There's salt deposits, efflorescence, where the water uh, pushes through, uh, carries with it salt deposits, and they, they, uh, it's called efflorescence. They appear on the outside of the well, What we don't want is um, water causing damage to the structure. But water penetration should be fixed as well. There's water penetration in the garage at just about every corner, every block. So we talked about water problems. Um, I think that was just a big pile of snow or something, because that's above ground. Garage door works. Old garage door. It's actually plugged in with an extension cord. That's not good. Plugged in there. Um, and th those are the wires that come into the garage um, from the panel inside the house. So I like the electrician to come. A lot of ground faults on the outside, and I wanted to take a look uh, at the uh, electrical wiring in the garage, detached garage. Uh, thermostat is um, an old manual thermostat, not programmable. Um, it's going to cost the money to operate this heating system, which is an oil-fired boiler. So if you're unfamiliar with this, that's OK. Um, this is like cold climate kind of heating system, especially northeast United States. Um, and this is a boiler. And how this works is um, it's basically a box, a cast iron box, could be metal, but typically a cast iron box, a box made out of cast iron. It's filled with water. And at the bottom of the cast iron box filled with water uh, is the heating system, essentially, the torch. So we suck oil from the tank into a burner, turn it into a mist, and spray it, and then ignite it under this cast iron box filled with water. And that's how we, <laughs> that's how we heat up uh, water, almost to the point of boiling. And then we circulate it with pumps and valves and thermostats. And you can zone this thing system so that it is sweet. You, could, you can just keep adding zones, uh, depending on the BTUs. But zoning it is really nice. It's very easy. It's hard to zone a furnace system that's blowing air. But a boiler system that's circulating hot water is very easy to zone. Um, it also can be used to heat up your um, water for your sinks and showers and tubs and things like that. So you get a coil of cold water, and it goes into this, remember that box of really hot, bo almost boiling water? Well, it coils in there, and then it coils back out. And by the time, it, you let's say you turn on a sink fixture, um, it's going to pull hot water through that coil. W cold water comes in, and by the time it comes out of that coil, it's, it can be boiling hot. It can be scalding hot, and it typically is. So that's why they have a tempering valve right here. Oh, it's too thick. So right here uh, is the valve that tempers the water. So here's, usually on the right, cold water comes in. There's a coil inside here where um, that coil is surrounded by the hot boiler water. And hot water comes out, and it gets tempered. You can control the temperature of the water and then it goes to all your fixtures. So here's the burner. We turn that oil that we suck from the oil tank into this burner, turn it into a mist. This is essentially the burner chamber. Um, and you got some tempering valves and some safety valves. This is a pump 
and it circulates the water, pulls water down, pushes it through the boiler, and it goes right up the top. And uh, there's a TPR valve and a shutoff switch and gauges and all that good stuff. So that's kind of fun. Boilers are kind of fun. Um, and what I do is I essentially take a picture of the system, remember, step back, and then I go into components. And if there's something written on a system, I'll take a picture of it. So manufacturing labels are really great because I can see the serial numbers and the manufacturing numbers and the model numbers and I can date the system if I wanted to. I would go deeper into my inspection. There's all the components there. Um, this one's the most important one where there's essentially two little things. There's a high and a low. Um, for the temperature low and and low cut in and cut out. Um, well, shut off switch, service switch, maintenance switch. Homeowners should know how the system works. So uh, basically how I described it is how I would describe it to my client. And I don't want to do this twice. So while I'm inspecting the heating system, I want my client with me right behind me at a safe distance. And I'm going to show them how the system works and how to maintain it. And what to look for and this is one of the components it's a shut off switch there's the circulating pump three zones first floor second floor and GAC I don't know what that means we're gonna find that thermostat um, it's actually garage GAR um, uh, and there's the temperature relief valve so in case um, the boiler uh, overheats or there's too much pressure um, it'll discharge it all looks good. I don't see any scorching. I don't see any major leaks, except right at the circulatory pump. Um, so that needs to be fixed. There's the flue pipe. So the, remember at the chimney, there were two flues, one for a fireplace, I'm assuming it's rectangular. And the circular or round or square um, flue is temp typically for the fuel-fired furnace, our heating system, and there it is. Um, Oil-fired uh, boiler needs a damper. Uh, to control the um, hot gases going up through the chimney stack. Um, this is in contact with um, combustible materials. That piece of wood uh, underneath the fireplace um, is in contact with that hot pipe, and that's a fire hazard. And there's plywood um, where the flue goes up through um, into the base structure, base of the chimney. And so there's two pieces where um, this needs to be I uh, tend to, and I'm surprised it hasn't caught on fire. So um, this is wood here, um, three inches, and this is wood here, and this is like an inch of clearance. So you need bigger clearance there. I like 12 inches, but I think code would be in this township six or eight. Um, as water is heated in any closed system, it expands, and you need to absorb that expansion. That's why you have those bladder tanks on hot water tanks on modern homes that have public water coming in through a check valve. It's a closed water system and you're heating up water so at the hot water tank, you typically have an expansion tank. Um, if you don't, then you may have dripping coming from the TPR valve. At the boiler, same thing. Um, boiler heats up, water expands, the expansion tank is above it, air tank essentially. There's the oil storage tank. I used to have one of these suckers. Smells disgusting. Uh, if it leaks, it's a problem. Um, it's in use, three quarters. Um, you typically buy the oil in the summertime when the costs are low um, ahead of time. The legs are the things in the belly of the tank is what I like to look at because that oil sludge is on the bottom. And I actually get my screwdriver during an inspection. I'll, I'll bang on the legs and I'll bang on the belly and I'll scrape um, anything that looks like a, a piece of rust. Um, oil is filtered before it gets to the heating system, and there's the main uh, emergency shutoff switch for the boiler. So those are the big three systems. What are they? Roof, exterior, heating system. If I can keep my client with me, we're going to go to the next system, which is plumbing. And I think of plumbing as drain waste vent, get the stuff out, and how does water come in? So what goes out in the plumbing and what comes in? So right now it's what goes out and it's public um, sewer, there's a clean out. I have copper drain waste vent pipes and cast iron. And I saw the four inch main vent stack, remember on the roof? And that looked in good shape. These pipes 
are supported really well. They're copper, amazing uh, material, uh, very expensive to use. Everything seems to be sloped and sealed well. The joints, I like it all. Looks really good. This is the garage. I don't like the firewall breach in the ceiling of the garage. There's a living space above. I want some firewall yeah, in the ceiling of the garage, and it's got to be airtight, and this isn't. Um, there's the public water. Remember the wellhead on the front of the house? So that pipe comes from the front of the house, underground. The wellhead is out here in the front yard. Um, it goes into, uh, there's a check, it looks like, a little drainage. There's a pressure gauge. There's um, uh, a, um, a gauge to um, gauge the pressure in the water line. So it's probably, there's a low and a high, probably 40, 60. Um, and the pump pumps water in this tank, which has a bladder, and it goes up to 60 PSI. And then as you use the water, it drains the tank and it goes down to 40 PSI. And it cycles back and forth. Uh, 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 uh. So you hear it kick on. You go. Not that fast, but um, as you use water. Um, yeah, so I take a look at for water leaks and then um, copper pipes throughout the house. There's a components. Remember, I take a picture of the system and then I move in and look at the components. The water's turned off. So if you look at the pattern, like flow is coming up through the valve with the red handle, goes through a filter, or it can bypass the filter, but both are off. So now I've done roof, exterior, HVAC, and I'm at the water, not water out. I did that already. Now it's water in, and it's turned off. So I immediately turn to my client and say, I, I have an inspection restriction, and I can't turn on the water. We're going to have to get someone who's responsible for the property to turn on the water. I need the homeowner to turn on the water or the homeowner's agent or someone to turn on the water. Well, the agent just came over and turned the, the valve, the ball valve, and turned the water on. And then I could continue with my inspection. And as soon as I did, a shutoff valve started leaking. So this valve started dripping. Um, and we let it drip um, while I was doing an inspection. And it looks like it's been dripping for a long time. The corrosion is there and the calcium deposits and all that stuff. So we let it drip. I never open a valve. If this had exploded, popped right off, and let's say the main shutoff valve opens but doesn't close, now I'm in trouble. I've taken on all of that responsibility. So all I do is I turn to my client, inform them what's going on. My inspection is restricted. We need somebody to take responsibility to turn on the water. That's why my office manager Make sure all the utilities are on prior to me arriving at my inspection. And you can do that with scheduling software now um, that is automated with messages via email and or text. There's a domestic coil, so I'm still on water coming into the house, um, being supplied to the fixtures, being heated up. There's the coil going in and out and tempering valve. That's all good. These tend to leak after about 15 years. Um, old garage door um, opener, um, using an extension cord um, to be um, operated with, and there are no GFCIs in this garage. And there's water penetration. That's an old moisture probe. They don't make them anymore. Um, I would just use something like this. If I had time, I'd open this up and stick it on an extendable pole so that I can reach things. Uh, and water faucet should be frost proof. And taking pictures. Hardly any of these pictures of the ceiling of the garage are in my inspection report, but I want to take a picture of it because I know that there's probably water fixtures or bathrooms or a half bath or something, kitchen upstairs. And I just want to make sure that I have seen, my camera forces me to look. So if I tell myself that I have to take a picture of everything, I'm forced to look with my eyes at everything, right? And I'm snapping away. I want to take a picture of everything. If I could, I'd take a picture of everything, take a video of everything. Um, the door in between your garage and the interior of the house should be, even the crawl space, if it shares the same air, um, should be a firewall. So this is a just a, an interior door that they slapped a piece of metal on. has no fire rating at all. 
now I'm at the electrical. I usually have my client with me still, um, but they may have peeled off. Um, they're not really into electricity. I'll tell them where the panel is and where the main shutoff is, and that's about it, and then they go off. Um, you're not required to remove the dead front cover, panel cover, the dead front panel cover. Um, I tend to do that. Uh, two fingers at the main shutoff switch means 200 amps. One is 100, and one in bent is 150 amps. There's a GFCI that has been turned off, not tripped. It's been turned off manually. I'm not going to reset any breakers. There's one to the left of that GFCI that says pool filter, that has been turned off manually. So I want to document actually all the breakers that have been turned off and or are tripped off. And there's a difference between the two. One is all the way, you can turn it off, and the other one, a trip breaker is kind of like in the middle and sometimes there's a bit of a color that might um, indicate that has, it has tripped. Never reset a breaker that has been off, turned off or tripped off or missing, yep, or taped over. So don't get hurt at the electrical panel. There's a missing screw at the panel cover. Missing screw. I take the panel cover off. You're not required to. Be safe when doing it. If you are going to do it, you're not required to. I'm looking for really overfusing, and I found it. So I actually, I found overfusing. Um, and a scorch on a wire connection. So something has melted at this wire, at this double pole breaker. So, boom, I got an electrician. I need an electrician member on the outside, all these GFCIs and the garage, detached garage. Now I need an electrician at the main panel. So I have a, two 20 amp breakers on each on each connected to 14 gauge wires, 14 two wires, and that's an overfusing, an impacity problem. There's the breaker is too big for the small gauge wire. That's it. All I really need to do is find those defects, and I'm really happy. There's the rod; it should be driven into the ground. So I need an electrician at the house. What do we need? We need a roofer at the house. Remember the missing, uh, damaged cap shingles on the wood shingle roof at the ridge. I'm concerned about the water. On the exterior, we'll see what's going on in the basement. Anything else you can think of? I need an electrician now. Oh, there's a HVAC has a drip at the pump, right? The circulating pump at the boiler. So I need all these professionals now, and all these things are going to be in my summary report. Not all the information needs to be communicated in a summary, all the good stuff, but only the things that I really want my client to take action on. Things that are damaged, missing, leaking, um, and electrical problems, safety issues. So I'm going to put those things in the summary. The foundation looks great. I don't have any problems. It's an old house, so the band joist isn't air sealed or insulated. That's okay. Um, there's that third zone for the garage ceiling. It's basically just a strip of boiler pipe um, wrapped with fins, and the fins get hot and they radiate out. Um, Benjamin asks, if the things like the deck are under the control and responsibility of an HOA, how much do you concentrate on that in your inspection report? I um, inspect the house regardless of um, community areas, um, who's responsible for what, HOAs, condominium rules. I, I inspect, uh, if the, it's a first floor condo, right? I'm going to try to inspect the roof, which is like, like probably over the third floor. Right? I'm gonna try to get up on the roof because um, if, um, if it's an HOA or some kind of condominium agreement, then I think every homeowner should know the condition of the roof. In really terrible, bad situations, the roof on the third floor, above the third floor condo, could affect all units below. Just like the vent pipe, the main vent stack pipe or the chimney pipes for that I can see on the roof on top of a condominium building, that could have an effect all the way down into the structure of the other condos on the condominiums. So when I inspect a house, I really 
inspect it regardless of all that stuff, HOA stuff. I inspect it as if it's all the same system because I know a house is a system of interdependent parts and every part affects all others. So if I'm inspecting a first floor condominium, I'm gonna to try to inspect the roof that's above the third floor condominium. Because I know there are things up there, potentially, that could affect all the way down here. Chimney flashing is one of them. Missing kick out flashing will allow water to travel 50 feet down. I've seen it myself. Missing kick out flashing looks great on the exterior, but it's allowing water to travel on the inside of the chimney stack, inside of that structure for all the chimneys, and it goes all the way down to the basement. So, yeah. Um, and then if there's some kind of HOA thing, you can, you can maybe include it in your report and disclaim it and ask your client to ask the seller for more information about the, the HOA and the agreement of the community and what are the community areas and who pays for the roof when it needs to be replaced and all that stuff. Um, did you mention the thermostat is over dimmers, which produces heat? Yeah. So uh, even the location of the thermostat, the type of thermostat and location of the thermostat and thermostat over dimmers, I've never even thought about that. That's beautiful. Yep. So anything that um, affects the thermostat from uh, accurately uh, assessing the air temperature of the larger room, uh, thermostats have a tough job. It's got to be in the right place. It's got to be away from, air, air, from everything else. Often it has to be away from um, airflow. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's really important to get your thermostat just tweaked quite right. Um, love thermostats on the exterior walls. That's just a hoot. Um, can you or should you recommend certain contractors for further inspect a system? Yeah, so there's a standard sentence that I say. Um, uh, correction and further evaluation by a licensed contractor. Um, or if it's not really going to be a licensed contractor, um, I'll, I'll add like professional contractor, right? Uh, have you ever had, have you ever had it that in mid inspection client asks you to stop as there are too many issues with the home? Um, yeah. Um, probably once or twice in my entire career after 10,000 inspections, literally thousands and thousands of inspections over 13 years. Um, because there's hardly anything you can do to um, kill the deal. Although that seems to be the common thing that real estate agents say about home inspectors, that we kill deals. We actually don't. There's hardly anything you can say that will kill the deal because remember where you are in this point in time. The home, your client, the potential home buyer, has probably spent months researching where to move, has found their home after filtering through maybe 30 homes, after seeing so many homes and walking through them. It's probably pre-qualified for a loan. It took a long time to get that. And has fallen in love with this house. And you're there really to find the big things that will tell them you got to stop this love affair because it's way too much. Or it's, it, here's problems. Here's a list of things to do at Home Depot or here are a list of things that you should negotiate to get fixed before you move in to the home that you love. I mean, it's an emotional transaction. There's some, there's a lot of finances, but it's really an emotional thing. When someone buys a home, there's hardly anything you can do or say to stop them from not purchasing the, the home that they love. So um, with that in mind, I don't pull any punches during my inspections or in my inspections report. If I see a problem, man, I say it with a smile and I write it down in the report and I don't uh, whitewash it, right? And I don't want to work with any real estate agents who um, don't respect that. But there have been um, inspections where we stop in the middle because it's just too much. And uh, it's typically because the house is vacant and the seller is not like available um, and it's as is. And um, there's some government things involved 
and all that stuff. So, and there's not a lot of movement in finances. So, um, when there's a lot of restrictions on the decision, then uh, what you say can have a huge effect. And um, yeah, so there's only been a couple of those. But overall, 99.9% .9 of all of my inspections have been um, free of that fear that um, what I say will uh, kill the deal. So that, you know, I have to watch what I say. Nope. I just um, am very excited when I find a defect. And if you say it with a smile, uh, your clients kind of appreciate it. And if you do a good job um, and the house goes through, um, you'll, you'll realize that your real estate agents that you want to work with, you get to start to choose who you want to work with. The ones you don't want to work with, don't. It's healthy for your business to say no every once in a while. Um, if a real estate agent that you uh, don't really work with or d doesn't respect you um, as a professional calls you up, it's kind of nice to say no. Um, water, right? So we have a lot of water on the exterior. This is the front wall um, near the front entry door. Um, I stick my moisture probe there. It is dry, but I don't care. I'm going to tell my client that I see signs of prior moisture intrusion. Uh, it's not structural. It hasn't caused structural damage, but uh, the step from the garage to the house is loose. I'm at the interior. There is no um, unfinished attic space in which I can crawl and, and look around. Um, it's a cathedral ceiling, so um, the roof is up. Um, there isn't much up above my head. So I'm going through the interior now. So in my mind, I'm kind of done, really. What do I have left? Interior, I don't have any attic space. Interior, windows, doors, receptacles, representative number, yada, yada, surfaces, uh, cosmetic things, handrails, and now bathrooms, GFCIs, toilets, flush the toilets, run the sinks, run the showers, the tubs, right? And then I get to the kitchen and turn the appliances on, and I'm done, right? So I, in, in my head, I'm planning what's going on, right? Remember the water is off, don't use. Uh, we turn the water on, homeowner turn the water on. There's a shower. When I see tile in a shower, I like to pound my hand on the bottom corners of the walls. It's a lot of fun when your hand goes through it. It's a lot of fun. Um, skylights, that, prone to water leaks. There's patching on the interior surfaces of the paint and things like that. Um, sometimes it's just condensation and dripping down on the interior. Often it is actually. Um, but I inspected this skylight from the outside, so I know it's okay structurally and with the flashing and everything like that on the outside. If there's something going on on the inside, I'm going to try to document it. And it might be just a cosmetic kind of thing. I like to take pictures of the trap and the GFCIs and the showers and the tubs and the bathroom exhaust. The ba all the bathrooms are exhausting through the roof. Remember that? The hoods. All bathroom exhausts should um, terminate outside. Uh, I don't like a second floor laundry area that doesn't have a catch pan and I can't see the hose connections. They should be pressure tested or the discharge pipe. I want to see where that goes. Um, so there's some inspection restrictions. Running all the water, flushing all the toilets and sinks and showers and tubs. I put all that in a report. Smoke detectors are really old. I just, uh, in every inspection report, I, th I think I just simply have a default narrative that says um, to replace all the smoke detectors with battery operated, if it's hardwired, with battery operated um, smoke and carbon monoxide combination. Because we have fuel burning uh, appliances. So the railing here is, um, maybe it was built to code back then. I don't care. I, I actually don't care. Um, if this was built to code back then, all of the home inspections that I do that have defects are from homes that were built to code back then. I mean, that's, that's the business that we're in. I mean, this is a major safety hazard, particularly for small children. And I love it when real estate agents say, well, it was built to code back then, right? Well, a lot of things built to code back then are now hazards and defects because people have gotten hurt, right? That's why code changes, especially um, fire code. 
And a lot of firemen fire, unfortunately, when uh, a, um, a fireman or a police officer or an electrician or a, someone licensed gets hurt, code changes. So I don't want a child to fall through. And I don't care if that house was built to code back then. That is a safety hazard. If I have a little kid, we can't go upstairs because of that, right? Um, looking for water on the ceiling below the roof, and I do. I see water, and it's dry, there, but there are water marks. So I, I have a narrative about water marks and what that indicates. Ask the seller. It may be actively leaking. I can't predict the future. It's a, certainly a sign of a roof leak from the past. Ask the seller to disclose, right? And the windows, the doors, oh, there's one little, I don't know what this is for. I don't have to know how everything works. I'm just a home inspector, right? I love to be a generalist, never use the word expert. Um, and there's a hatch in the ceiling below the roof and you open the hatch and it doesn't open and all I can do is see that there's a fan in there. I have no idea what's going on. So uh, I just put in my report that the seller needs to uh, disclose what's going on. So this is the second floor balcony area. The structure looks okay. The railing looks okay. Great vantage point from this, for the cedar. Come back in, more bathrooms, receptacles, interior looks great. There's watermarks around the slider door. Ask the seller for more information. The stove, um, the fireplace chimney stack has a stove insert. Um, looked really good. Exterior looks good. It's just another advantage point. Love another vantage point. There's a railing, interior, kitchen, garbage disposal, didn't turn on. Don't know why. Um, there's some kind of um, puffy seat thing that's holding up the sink trap. Um, so that's kind of an odd thing. All right. So someone needs to look at that. And there's some duct tape. I'm not too concerned about that. GFCI receptacles missing. Dishwasher. I did a short cycle while I was there. Um, it's in good shape. The bottom heating element for the oven did not turn on. Missing GFCIs at the kitchen. And here's my inspection report. Um, some fire inspectors make you change during building walkthroughs in Florida, and they don't care if it was up to code years before. That's right, Alfred. Perfect. I agree. Uh, how long does it take it normally to take you to inspect the inside of a normal home? Oh, um, probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a few minutes in each bathroom, a few minutes in the interior. I'm, I'm getting to the kitchen because that's where I wrap up. I've clicked my software um, to create a summary report. I can do something with that or uh, I can wait until later. I explain to my clients the problems, I review the summary report with my clients. Um, if, they, if I have nothing else to do and my clients want to stay, I'll produce the entire report in the kitchen. I'll even print it out. I used to carry a, a full color um, inkjet printer and with a little handle um, that my, in a bag. And um, yeah, I used to print them out if, I, if my client wanted to and I had time. Otherwise, uh, it's electric, uh, electronic submission of the report later on. So here's my inspection report. Um, let's just go through it. It's two pages per slide. Um, I open up with what really matters during a home inspection, and it really goes down to major defects. An example would be a, a structural failure. We don't have any major defects here or material defects. Um, things that may lead to a major defect, like a small water leak coming from a piece of flashing, for example, and we do have some concerns about water penetration into the home. Things that may hinder your ability to finance, legally occupy or insure the home, uh, structural damage caused by termite infestation. So the carpenter bees might uh, come into play with that and the safety hazards such as a lack of GFCI protection. So that what, that's what really matters during a home inspection. I'm trying to set the expectation for my clients 
And during the inspection, make them focus on what really matters. And after the inspection, review what really matters. Um, and so uh, my reports have about, well, a, a few dozen inspection pictures in each. And um, what I do is I describe a system and then I break it down in, into components. So the exterior actually starts here, if you, if you can see. So there's the exterior title, uh, like a paragraph for a disclaimer, and then some titles and some pictures. And then uh, let's see if I can, next page, oops. So next page I have um, more pictures and more narratives and some concerns about moisture coming in and some recommendations in red, like monitoring or correction and further evaluation, uh, some wood rot, and then the exterior components is under a title. So I start with driveway and parking, the deck, uh, steps and handrails, exterior water faucets, receptacles and GFCIs, retaining walls, balconies, lights, doorbells, landscaping and trees. So all of this I don't have to remember. It's just in my software and click, 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 click. Next month I'm um, doing a class on how to, ins um, how to write an inspection report using software. So you may be interested in that. And that's at nachi.tv, N-A-C-H-I.tv, that, that URL. Um, so systems, components, and pictures that help me communicate the major things, uh, what really matters during a home inspection. Um, some of the pictures are just um, uh, like narrative pictures, description pictures, like here's the garage roof, took a picture of that, picture of that. Just, it's not identifying anything in particular, but when we get to the interior of the garage, then I go for defects, like there's some water penetration, and the garage is not, um, don't, doesn't have any, it's an old system, doesn't have any infrared, doesn't have any um, auto reverse, um, it's, it's uh, plugged in with an extension cord, things like that. And there's where the extra pictures come in. And so there's the boiler system, a bunch of general pictures of the system, and then I go into detail about the thermostat, electric shutoff switch, oil-fired boiler, circulating pump, the zones. Every component has a picture with it. I kind of like doing that. And there's the electrical. Got some problems. The electrician. Structure. We have water penetration. Bathrooms. Some few, few things in there. Not major basically a lot of GFCIs. There's water marks on a few things inside the house observed on the slider door, on some windows, on the wooden planks of the ceiling upstairs, interior rail as, as a safety hazard. The gar gar garbage disposal does not work. GFCIs are lacking. Dishwasher worked. The bottom element of the oven did not turn on. And then some um, observations about how we prefer our clients to walk with us during the inspection and why, and that we do not inspect pools. Internet she has an amazing gallery of illustrations and graphics that you can use, members can use in their inspection reports. So this helps me describe what I'm looking at, best practices, standards, what a good roof looks like. I'm looking for these things um, for a shingle roof. And this is a shake roof. And there's the intermittent, uh, interlayment, it's called. That's uh, layers of felt. That's how you fasten the shingles. There's how a boiler works. So I kind of like the graphics. Um, I tag them on at the end, kind of like icing on the cake. Um, a little conclusion about um, how we um, can come through the house again just before you sign your name on the line um, with the bank. And then there's a letter to the seller or homeowner or occupant saying that we touched 500 things. We may have not put everything back exactly where it was, but we tried our best and we wore indoor only shoes. Um, and then there's a few things like some marketing pieces because every seller could be a, a potential client for you. And they have, every seller has a copy of your best marketing piece, remember. Um, and here's a creative idea. You leave a lunchbox and uh, it, your business card snaps in it. And then uh, you put this on the kitchen 
uh, counter for the seller to open up, and inside could be um, some marketing pieces from your company, some candy. Um, hey, uh, if you're moving in the neighborhood, um, consider hiring us. Here's um, um, a coupon or a flyer or something special. And that's a lunchbox that you can leave. And that you can get at it our um, e-commerce partner, inspectoroutlet.com. And here's a report summary. No pictures, just straight to the point. And in Pennsylvania, um, you were able to provide cost estimates uh, if you um, made them in a range and identified the source. And uh, that is about it. Um, Alfred asks, what is your information on writing at the end of life on your report? Do you or don't? Um, I do. If I know that this thing is at the end of its life, uh, it's about to crap out and die, um, I'll certainly express that knowledge. If I have that opinion, I'm going to tell my client. I'm going to be on their side. Um, so if I know something that they ought to know, I'm going to communicate with that. Again, I don't hold anything back. Um, and we have an InterNACHI life expectancy chart published by InterNACHI um, based upon data, and um, that's available online. If you can't find it, go to nachi.org forward slash everything. That's that URL that we talked about before. Jet, do you charge to come back during the walkthrough? I do, um, but I really love to do them for free. So if financially I can, via my schedule I can, or maybe there's a an advantage for me for doing them for free, um, like beating out my clients, like you know, doing a free walkthrough just before my client purchases the house. You know, on the day of closing, I walk through the house with them again. Boy, that'd be great to do it for free at their convenience on their schedule. Um, yeah, because uh, I thought of all of my clients as clients, and that they're living as um, they're living in my neighborhood, so we're neighbors, and that I have a client base, and I'm going to take care of them. Um, personally, um, n even now, everyone in my neighborhood knows that I'm the home inspector, and people still call me up um, from all over the, the county and call me up for advice about things. Um, whenever there's a problem in the neighborhood, um, I'm the one who's called. I have the tools, I have the moisture meters, infrared cameras. This is my base, this is my client base. You should actually think of you building a client base um, for one main reason, that your clients are going to talk about you and you want them to say good things. And if you just take their money and go um, and don't keep in contact with them, who knows what they're saying, right? So you always wanna keep in contact with your clients, you want a client base. And you can do that in many ways. You can send them things. You can invite them over every summer for a grill, a cookout in your backyard, um, which is a great idea. Um, and uh, invite real estate agents too. Um, there's so many marketing ideas. We can talk about that as well. And I've done marketing classes before, and they're all recorded on Nachi TV. So, or you can call up our marketing department. Jessica is the director of marketing. Membership marketing, she'll help you with your marketing strategies and brandings and, and uh, things like that. I don't know what the question was. What was it? Where did we go? I tend to do this. I just rattle off and I go in a different direction. Oh, what do I charge for an inspection? There's two ways to skin this cat, right? Uh, I don't know where they get that saying. Um, you can tell people what you charge. Like I told people what I charge, $396. For a home inspection, I don't care what the size is. Big, small, little, whatever. $396. And then on top of that, I may charge you more if it's extremely large, over 4,000 square feet, over 40 miles away, over 40 years old, right? So um, then I'll charge more. Um, and that is a good inspection. Because I wanted the phone to ring for my office manager or for myself and know that this is an... Um, this is profit, because so I've calculated my prices, I understand what my overhead is, my desired annual salary, my desired profit margin, and when that phone rings and it's a client, I know that this is profit because they know what I charge and they're calling me. That's the kind of phone call I want. 
I don't want to be a salesman over the phone and negotiate about my prices and tell them why I charge this much and like reveal that it's $400 only after they call me. That's just uh, my method. It may be a great way for you to run your business. It's up to you. Do you tell people what your prices are or do you um, tell them after they call you and ask how much do you charge? Then there's that whole negotiating, selling pitch going on. Um, would it be different than a reinspection? I've done a lot of reinspections where I say uh, in the crawl space, like there's a structural problem that needs to be fixed, and then they hire me to come back and do a report just on that system or component that they fixed, and I'll charge for that because I'll go crazy. I'll refer to code and standards, and I'll follow up with the contractor and all that stuff, and I'll put documents together. So it'll take me just about as long as a home inspection. I'll charge as much as a home inspection. Yeah. But a walkthrough where I don't even like bring tools, right? We're just walking through and making sure everything's okay and just giving an opinion, shaking their hands and welcoming, welcoming them to the neighborhood. Um, I, I won't charge for that. What report software do you recommend? Well, um, there are two softwares that I like. There's HomeGage, it works on PCs, and there's Home Inspector Pro, which works on everything, PCs and, and Apple. And I'm an Apple guy. Um, so, yeah, it works really well with iOS, um, iPhones, and things like that. Um, what kind of moisture meter do you use, pin or pinless? Both. It's one that has pinless and pin. Have you ever had a false positive readings? Does a pin moisture meter leave unacceptable holes in a drywall? I only pin it if um, I know that there's damage and there's moisture damage already, and this drywall is going to be cut out. That's kind of like my opportunity to have fun with a with my digital camera, so I stick it in there and take a picture of it. Um, I don't um, cause damage on things that I don't really already suspect that's, that it's already damaged, right? So I'll stick my finger into something that is rotten, because I can see that it's wood rot, and I'll take a picture of it, right? Just to demonstrate how rotten it is. I'll crush something with my hand, I'll grab a beam and pull it out, and then take a picture of it. But I'm not poking things that are in good condition, right? And saying, well, nothing wrong here. Bam, nothing wrong here. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I'm very careful with other people's property. But um, I really like those pictures, you know. Um, oh, did you ever have false positive readings? No, actually. Um, or, or maybe, and I don't know because I didn't have two moisture meters, right? Maybe the water marks had certain elevated levels of water moisture in a certain area. Maybe it was on the rim of the water mark, and I, my moisture meter didn't pick it up, and it told me dry when it actually was wet. So maybe, maybe that. But I've never had it the opposite way, where I, I say my moisture meter says it's wet, and it actually is dry. That's never happened, right? The best tool you can have to find um, air leaks, uh, wet, moisture, heat. Best tool in the whole world is this, your hand. The back of your hand is really great too. So this can tell you a lot. And hopefully you don't leave home without it. Bring it, all, bring it to your inspection for every inspection. Bring your hands to your inspection. They're the best tools in the whole world. What are the options on training and becoming certified? Um, everything is online through InterNACHI. You can become trained and certified. Um, you can become a cer certified professional inspector. That's a federally registered certification mark, CPI. And no one on the planet can say I'm a CPI except an InterNACHI certified home inspector. And all of that certification training is online through InterNACHI. And we also have live classes all over the world. Uh, like the, I like to train the House of Horrors, but financially it will be a challenge. But I want to live training like this, live training like this, but I want live training like this. Yeah. So the house of horrors is um, unique to the planet. There's nothing else on it. So the internet house of horrors is a house built within our building under our roof, an entire house with a thousand defects. And it's designed to teach you how to find defects. And we put a thousand of them. Some of them are obvious, some of them are difficult. 
there's a lot of advanced training from the House of Horrors. So we have one House of Horrors in Boulder, Colorado. We're building one currently in Florida. We're going to Southern California. And I think we're going um, Northwest, Washington, and then Canada. I'm all over the world. Well, in North America, United States and Canada. You can visit the House of Horrors for free, just about any time, whenever there isn't something else going on, and do a self-guided tour. And at the House of Horrors, you get an iPad, and you run through the iPad. And the iPad is an online inspection guide, and it shows you all the defects that you're supposed to find. So you can test yourself. You can go through the House of Horrors and inspect it, and then come back to the iPad and see what you missed, right? and why you missed it. So that's available at all the Houses of Horrors. Um, and uh, it's open and, and you can do a, a free self-guided tour. No problem. If you're in the neighborhood in Boulder, come on by. Uh, call the school first to make sure that nothing else is going on. We have classes going on all the time. All right, a lot of people want to say goodbye. Um, remember, this class is recorded, so you may be watching it already. Um, but I want to say goodbye and thank you so much for being here. I hope you got a ton of value in it. Um, go to Nachi TV for the re video recording of all of our classes. We record them all. And to uh, register, free registration for the next upcoming class. My name is Ben Gromico. I'm from InterNACHI, and I'll see you all later. See you in class. Bye, y'all.